Fundamental to these theories has been the idea that the rate of aging is ultimately shaped by extrinsic mortality. The more extrinsic mortality, the less we will be paying the costs of some dangerous mutation. Now, the flip side of this is if extrinsic mortality is very low, then we expect that species should show adaptations to be able to live a lot, lot longer. So remember the giant tortoises. They live on islands. They have no predators. And so it's no surprise that it's the giant tortoises that have such exceptionally long lifespan. Adwaitia, the Aldabra tortoise that lived to be 255 years of age. Another one, unpronounceable from Madagascar, lived to be 188 years old. And Harriet, this is a tortoise that was delivered to a British zoo by Darwin after traveling to the Galapagos. And she lived to be 176 years of age. So these animals that otherwise are not subject to extrinsic mortality are capable of a huge long lifespan. One of the most remarkable examples of this sort is in a rodent, the naked mole rat. The naked mole rat is about the size of an, like a, rat, a lab rat. But these live entirely below ground, a very special kind of lifestyle. They're not subject to diseases. There are very few predators. So their extrinsic mortality rate is extremely low compared to an above ground rodent that may be eaten by snakes, hawks, or rat traps. If you look at rodents this size who are subject to a lot of mortality, extrinsic mortality, if you put them in the lab and let them live as long as they possibly can, their maximum lifespan is still only one or two years. But how long does a naked mole rat live? Naked mole rats can live to be over 26 years of age, an extraordinary lifespan for such a small animal. But this is a species that's ordinarily not exposed to extrinsic mortality. So therefore, evolution is going to favor greater physiological repair mechanisms. And in fact, naked mole rats turn out to produce very high levels of telomerase. Their telomeres don't shorten, and they also have a gene that prevents them from getting cancer. So they do indeed have the physiological adaptations that allow them to live to a very advanced age. So, if we have an appreciation for our own risks in our evolutionary past, we would have been subject to disease, we could have been eaten by lions, we could have been uh, suffering all kinds of slings and arrows out there. But modern humans now have got improved nutrition, we've got health care that have greatly reduced our risk of death from extrinsic mortality. Human lifespans have been extended quite dramatically over the last one and a half centuries. In the 1850s, the best data we have are from Norway, and the life expectancy there was only 45 to 50 years of age. We get more and more data sets coming in, and they're all converging about the same place. But now worldwide, people can expect to live to be about 85 years of age. What this means is that now, for the very first time in the history of our species, we have lots of individuals living long enough to suffer the costs of those aging genes or age-related genes. So our life, expectancy, our life expectancy has risen so fast that we as a society now face an epidemic of age-related disorders. That is, we're living long enough to senesce and to really fall apart in front of each other. For example, there is Alzheimer's, a form of dementia where the brain deteriorates in advanced age. So this is a cross-section of a healthy brain here. People with Alzheimer's, the gray matter is greatly reduced. Bone density decreases with age, and so especially in women, very susceptible to osteoporosis, their bones can snap very easily. Again, these are only problems in really older people. Old people also get a deterioration of their vision they cannot see in the middle of uh, what they're looking at, and that's called macular degeneration. And then heart disease also increases with age, and old people get diseased hearts. Okay, so all of these traits are associated with growing old. 
and many of these traits, almost all of them, are known to have a genetic component. But there's no evidence of any sort of pleiotropy. It's not that, oh, we were able to run faster or uh, be more attractive to the opposite sex uh, because we had some gene that's later on going to cause us problems. No, these just seem to have been silent mutations sitting in our gene pool that largely would never have been expressed. But now there's so many people reaching those old ages, we're seeing an epidemic of these different disorders. So given that we're all likely to reach a very advanced age to an age where some of those senescent traits are likely to, tr to kick in, what can we do to try to extend our own lifespans? Well, a long known technique, at least assumed technique for extending lifespan is dietary restriction. And in many, many different species, particularly in rodents, fruit flies, nematodes, even yeast, if you starve these organisms, they live a lot longer. Now, in humans, this was perceived as long ago as in the 1500s, when Luigi Carnaro rather amazingly said, the sure and certain method of attaining a long and beautiful life was to restrict your diet to the equivalent of less than 12 ounces of solid food per day, although he did allow you 13 ounces of wine. Now, studies are going on around the world right now looking to see how well dietary restriction really might work to extend lifespan. In primate facilities in Wisconsin, there are a couple of rhesus macaques that are being given alternative diets. And here we have Kanto on the left, who's 25 years of age and looks in pretty good shape, but he's never given quite as much to eat as he would like. He's always hungry, okay? but he looks in pretty good shape. In contrast, we have Owen here, who's just a year older than Kanto, and he's always been allowed to eat everything he wants. And the guy's a wreck, okay? So it looks like dietary restriction could well reduce the rate of physiological aging. But these are shown to work when the diet is really quite severely restricted. So it's 30% less calories than normal, and this results a complete loss of desire. Okay? Caloric restriction extends lifespan in these things like yeast and nematodes and rodents because it shuts off their reproductive system. And once they've shut off the reproductive system, all their cellular energy is devoted to DNA repair and looking after the organism itself. So, do we have a trade-off then between the quantity of life versus the quality of life? Thinking back about Edwaitia and those long-lived tortoises that just seem so bored out of their minds, but they do get to live a long, long time, is the best way to extend lifespan inevitably likely to lead to a profusion of days, but a seeming waste of longevity on an organism that would appear to relish it so little. Now, in contrast to the caloric restriction, there's another idea out there that's gaining a lot more interest recently. And that is another aspect of cellular, late, cellular aging depends on what happens with our mitochondria. Remember our mitochondria are endosymbiotic organelles that produce energy for the cell. Okay? So they live and breed inside of our cells and they provide energy. They're the main sites of re free radical production within the cells. So that stuff that damages our DNA, the hydrogen peroxide and everything else, largely originates out of the mitochondria. So, if you actually work out, get plenty of exercise, this can revitalize the mitochondria and this can reduce the production of free radicals. So perhaps a better solution if you want to try to live a good, long, healthy life is not to starve yourself, but get out there and be vigorous and have a very active life.